You're listening to Brains On from American Public Media. We're serious about being curious. I'm Molly Bloom. I don't know about you, but the times that I've gone in the ocean, I always keep my mouth closed tight because I do not like how that water tastes. It is really, really salty. Ugh. Grosses me out just thinking about it. Still, it raises an interesting question. Our question is, why are oceans salty while lakes and rivers are not? That's Corinne and Sophie with what sounds like a simple question. And you'd think there would be a simple answer, but this is one of those times when things are a little more complicated than you might think. Here to explain is Phoebe Lamb. I'm a chemical oceanographer at University of California, Santa Cruz. When we're talking about salt in the ocean, it's important to know what that means. Is it the same as the salt in our food? The way they defined it originally was they would take a kilogram of seawater and then they would evaporate it and they would measure what was left. And you'd get some, like a pile of white powder at the end and you weigh it. And that was how salinity was defined, was the the mass of dry solid in a kilogram of seawater. Salinity tells us the amount of salts that are dissolved in water. So the higher the salinity of the water, the more salty. Seawater has a salinity of what we call 35 parts per thousand. And that means you take a kilogram of seawater, you end up with 35 grams of solid stuff at the end of it. If you were to analyze the chemical composition of that solid stuff, most of it would be sodium and chloride. Uh, but there, there are other things. It turns out there are many kinds of salt. In fact, a salt is just a certain kind of chemical compound. The majority of the salt in the ocean is sodium chloride, which is the same as table salt. But there are also a bunch of other salts made from other minerals, too. Magnesium and sulfate and calcium and potassium and all sorts of other elements. So when you taste sea salt, salt that's actually been harvested from seawater, it has some of these other elements in it, which gives it a slightly more bitter taste than regular old table salt. So with all of these minerals in the ocean, it leads to our next question. How did all this stuff get there in the first place? It comes from the rivers. So ultimately, all of the saltiness in the ocean got there from rivers. And you would probably ask, well, rivers aren't salty. Exactly. And that's what Corinne and Sophie want to know. Why are oceans salty while lakes and rivers are not? Actually, rivers and lakes do have salt in them, just not as much as the ocean. And the reason for that is because lakes have outlets, places where the water escapes. Even if you can't see a big river or stream coming off a lake, there are still outlets. Eventually, smaller outlets lead to rivers, and these rivers lead to the ocean. So the water is constantly going into lakes and flowing out of them. The ocean is kind of like a big lake, but with no outlet. And even though water keeps coming in, the ocean isn't getting bigger. That means it's also losing water through evaporation. And when water evaporates off the ocean, it concentrates the salt brought in by the rivers. There are actually a handful of lakes with no outlets, too. And guess what? They are also salty. If you're ever in Utah, check out the Great Salt Lake. The name kind of says it all. Now we know how salt travels into the ocean, but how do these minerals get into the rivers and lakes in the first place? It's from erosion. Soil and rocks near lakes and rivers slowly break down. When they do, they drop bits of minerals into the water, and those minerals eventually flow to the ocean where they collect. This leads to the next question. If these salts keep coming into the ocean, why isn't it getting saltier and saltier all the time? So the salts are coming in, but they're also being removed from mineral precipitation. Usually we hear the word precipitation and think rain. Water on land evaporates and becomes rain clouds. It turns out minerals do something similar. Mineral precipitation in the ocean happens when dissolved minerals come out of the salty solution and form solids again. Some of these minerals that precipitate out fall to the ocean floor and end up forming sedimentary rocks like gypsum. That's the main component in sheetrock, the stuff that makes the walls in your house or school. So in a way, your home may have very well been formed by this ocean cycle. This precipitation helps the ocean keep its balance, that 35 parts per thousand that Phoebe mentioned earlier. But there are regional differences due to precipitation and evaporation. For instance, parts of the Atlantic are as high as 37, and parts of the Pacific are as low as 32. But the average is 35, and it's been about 35 for millions of years. 
there are lots of factors that come into play to keep this balance going. Water evaporates, fresh water is added by rivers and rain, minerals come in through these rivers and through underwater openings called hydrothermal vents. In fact, hydrothermal vents are also one of the ways minerals are being precipitated out. More on hydrothermal vents later in the show. The ocean is this sort of complicated machine that balances how salty it is. I teach it in my graduate chemical oceanography class, so it does end up being a little bit more complicated. You know, maybe the best way to get this all across would be to write a song. Oh, cool. That's awesome. Yeah. We'll call it the Salty Sea Cycle. But before that salty song, it's time for some natural noises to knock on your eardrums. It's time for the mystery sound. Here it is. We'll be back with the answer and the debut of our song right after this. Right now, we're working on an episode about pianos. You know what a piano sounds like, right? We want to hear your ideas for a different sounding piano. What sounds would you like to come out of your piano? I think I would like a piano that makes a sound that instantly puts a one-year-old to sleep when it's nap time. That would be nice. Send your ideas to hello at brainson.org. And if you have any other questions, mystery sounds, high fives, or drawings you'd like to share with us, you can send those to that same email address. Now's the time in the show when we thank the awesome kids who keep this show going with their ideas and energy. Here's the most recent group to be added to the Brains Honor Roll. Gabe from Fort Collins, Colorado, London from Mount Clemens, Michigan, Cooper and Mercedes from Montpelier, Vermont, Tegan and Everett from Mobile, Wyatt from Pittsburgh, Reagan from Hurdsville, North Dakota, Brady, Ian, and Rory from Granger, Indiana, Elliot from Bainbridge, Washington, Sienna from Maynard, Massachusetts, Maximilian and Levon from Washington Heights, New York, Millie from Pittsburgh, Matthew and Michael from Frisco, Texas, Amelia from Washington, D.C., Penelope from Norris, Tennessee, Lucy from Hillsville, Australia, Lily from Medfield, Massachusetts, James and Lauren from Boulder, Carson from Truckee, California, Penny from Springfield, Illinois, Pablo from Winnipeg, Elizabeth, Elizabeth, William, and David from Richfield, Washington, Ben and Winnie from L.A., Sylvia from Anna Cortez, Washington, Christopher from Kent, Ohio, Jack from Fort Collins, and C.J. from Springfield, Virginia. Ready for that mystery sound again? Here it is. Here's the answer. We're Hannah, Abby, and Bert from Sydney, Australia. That was the sound of a kookaburra laughing. I hear them every morning outside my bedroom window. Kookaburras have a short, thick body and a medium length tail. They are my favorite Australian bird. I like this mystery sound because it makes me laugh. The kookaburra sits in the old gum tree. Merry, merry king of the bushes. I'm sorry. That's not the song you're waiting to hear, but I couldn't help myself. This is the song you're waiting to hear. Here it is, our Salty Sea Shanty. Oh, rocks erode and minerals flow To the ocean where they have nowhere to go These minerals stay dissolved in the sea Where they taste salty to you and to me The ocean has found a balance so sweet that it fast fast but thousand salinity. A balance just right. We all give a cheer. That's it. flow in, other salts leave, precipitating so they can be. Rocks once more, sedimentary, evaporates like gypsum, come out to the sea. The Atlantic, Pacific, Indian too, these oceans make up a great salty stew.
to make a video of this song and we'd like to include some of your drawings in it. Send us a drawing of something you would see on or under the ocean. It could be a magnificent sea creature or a seaworthy vessel. Send your drawings to hello at brainson.org and we'll include as many as we can in the video. Now we're going to travel to the silent depths of the ocean. Hydrothermal vents, also known as underwater hot springs, are super fascinating and also very important in helping minerals come in and out of the ocean. These vents occur where there are underwater volcanoes. Seawater goes down into the crust and is heated up by very hot magma. Over 70% of the volcanic activity on Earth occurs underwater, but most people don't know it because they never get to see it. That's oceanographer Deborah Kelly from the University of Washington. These vents are referred to as black smokers because they're basically chimneys that spew out superheated water. The water coming out of the vent looks like black smoke because it contains fine mineral particles, making it darker than the water around it. She's had the opportunity to go deep underwater in a small submarine to study these vents up close. It's one of the most fantastic things I've ever done. Uh, I always have been down more than 50 times um, and I would drop anything usually to go down there. And the first 300 feet or so or more are kind of sunlit because the light penetrates. And then you go into complete darkness. And a lot of the organisms are bioluminescent, so they, so to speak, glow in the dark. And the vehicle's dark inside. And you can put your face up against the window, and it, it looks like you're falling through the stars. Almost every time we go down there, we see something new, or you know that you're the first human eyes to ever Ever see that? Scientists have learned a lot from these underwater hot springs, but they weren't discovered until relatively recently. Scientists did not know they existed until the 1970s. In my world, they're probably one of the most profound discoveries on the planet because before then, uh, most people thought that life, you know, was driven by sunlight. And so in this environment, where it's uh, life is in perpetual darkness, and so the, the organisms there, when they first discovered them, really transformed how we think about life on this planet and where it can uh, thrive on other planets as well. Around that area, there's large crabs. Uh, there's worms that grow six feet tall that can live 100 years. There's also in the Atlantic, there's billions of shrimp um, that cover these, these hydrothermal hot springs because there are a lot of bacteria there. Uh, many people think that life started within the hydrothermal vents on, on the planet. And so these organisms, they tolerate almost anything that would kill humans. Certainly microbes, not only in the hydrothermal vents, but in the world's oceans, are incredibly important. Uh, they, um, they process chemicals. Uh, they are the food chain for lots of other organisms. These tiny organisms can actually take toxic metals out of the water, so mining companies are using them to clean water. Scientists are working to see if these organisms could be used to capture carbon dioxide or possibly even develop new medicines. Deborah Kelly stumbled into this field, but she's very excited about all there is to learn in the future. Oh, I definitely stumbled. I started out as a music major, and um, but I wanted to be a Russian interpreter. And then I went into graphic design and took a geology class and fell in love wandering around volcanoes. And this love of volcanoes led to an interest in hydrothermal vents. You know, when I was growing up, it's the whole, uh, you know, I wasn't the smartest kid. I worked hard, but um, I, I always thought that um, discoveries were... Uh, for somebody else, right? And and uh, right now in oceanography, um, you know, the, the oceans really govern the health of our planet. And I think understanding not only the hot springs, but the oceans that we live in um, is going to be more and more critical. And as kids come up through, you know, K-12 and into college, and this is one of the areas where there's a potential for a really huge discoveries, and many of them, not just a couple. The ocean really is the last frontier on Earth. That's it for this episode of Brains On. Many thanks to Veronica Rodriguez, Tim Mining, Jessica Carilli, and Ignacio Pujana. We'll be back soon with more answers to your questions. Thanks for listening.